on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I was like, I need to bust my butt to like make sure that when this baby comes, I can work and support my family at the same time. And so it was kind of like, you have no choice, like make it work. And so that's what I did. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Welcome along to a Friday. Hello, Mark. Um, uh, Exciting few minutes we've got ahead of us because we've got lots to announce and then a really good interview really fun absorbing interesting inspiring interview with somebody who's very recently number one in the entire amazon store uh megan quinn coming up very shortly a couple of things to say before then mark i think we have a patreon supporter to welcome yeah you were going to do the patreon support i'm going to do the foundation i'm going to welcome what i'll do is rosalie isn't it rosalie from um very near me in salisbury actually so she's um she emailed me yesterday and um and thanked us for all the free stuff we put out, which was very nice to hear. Um, and yeah, she's a Netherhaven, so near an airfield, actually, James. Mm, so yes, you'll be excited indeed. to hear. Um, very excited. So yes, thank you, thank you to Rosa. It's much appreciated. Uh, on the aviation front, I'm glad you mentioned it. So uh, yesterday, oh, I, God. I posted I on TikTok. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm doing an odd things. I'm editing our TikTok for Authors Course, which is going to be released in a couple of weeks at the same time as trying to get onto TikTok and establish something on there. So I'm kind of jumping ahead of what I'm being taught and guessing some of the time. So I'm suddenly realizing things that I should be doing. One of the things is Jane uh, Ryland, one of the instructors in the course, talks about how often you should post, which is surprising, the answer. I know I hadn't posted for a day or two. And in about five minutes yesterday morning, I saw there was something happening on Twitter with B-52s flying from America to Europe. And I knew they'd be based at Fairford because that's normally where they are. So I went on and I said, ah, oh, update, you know, some B-52s are traveling across the uh, the Atlantic, probably to do with the uh, Ukraine buildup. They're going to be at Fairford. I've had nearly 100,000 views on that. So I've got 90,000 wow. views as we're sta- standing at the moment. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Absolutely blew up. And um, which reminds me also a TikTok thing is, you, is any social media. I've never had that level of exposure before. And of course you get a fair amount of abuse. You just do uh, in this world. People think they know more than you. They think you're something you're not. Mm. Uh, and you do have to have a thick skin uh, in this world. So uh, I see a few comments in our in our Facebook group that women in particular get some unwanted attention. Yep. And I've certainly yep. had, I've had personal comments about my appearance. I've had comments <laughs> about what I should and shouldn't be saying. And you just, I think, delete a few if you want, but just ignore them. Let them wash over you. I've got 300 comments on that. Wow. Um, maybe more than that now on that, on that thing. So I'll check that out. Yeah, check it out. Uh, They're near you, actually, Gloucestershire. The way, uh, the B-52s, you might see them flying over. You haven't got COVID, have you? Uh, I hope not, because I'm going skiing on Saturday. My wife will divorce me if I go down with COVID. Um, But I might do a test. Uh, Always best to do a test. We don't have to do a test to travel. So, But uh, we do, of course, have to have a small metric ton of paperwork which i now have printed out on my kitchen table as is today look let's uh, yes. crack on we've got stuff to do so we've done our patreon but very exciting because it's the new year which means uh your wife lucy has been very busy in the spf foundation department and we have awarded our foundation winners for 2022 and we are very very excited to announce them today so mark to should we do one each Cool. So the first one, um, writing under the name R.L. Giddings, is Rick Giddings. He writes in sci-fi, and he has been sponsored by Reedsy. Thank you very much indeed. And we have another one uh, sponsored by Reedsy, writing in romance, and that is Lily Hammond, who writes under Lix Robinson. Good name, Lix. Congratulations, Lily and Rick. And then we've got, um, sponsored by SPF, uh, we have Marco Blank, who writes as Mark Layton in horror. Congratulations, Marco, and a thriller writer sponsored by our friends at Written Word Media. You'll know them for free booksy and bargain booksy in particular, uh, is Peter Rebetz. Uh, well done, Peter. He writes under the name Peter J. Black. And uh, an, an SPF um, sponsored uh, foundation winner, Isabel Hardesty, who writes uh, 
uh, young adult. So congratulations, Isabel. Now, sponsored by Lucy Score, therefore a romance writer is Joe Preston. Congratulations, Joe, on your award of the foundation uh, money and uh, resources. Jay Preston, she writes under. Um, and then in women's fiction, sponsored by Catherine Caron, is Halima Katoon. Well done, Halima. Thank you, Catherine and Lucy, for those uh, romance uh, and women's fiction sponsorships. Uh, now, sponsored by Mark Recklau, our friend Mark. Uh, in writing in the fantasy genre, this is Brogan Thomas. Congratulations, Brogan. And last but not least, Stuart McCallum, who writes under the name of Stuart Clyde, thrillers um, and uh, military uh, fiction, sponsored by James Rossone. So, Congratulations to Stuart and to all of the other winners this year. And uh, they get uh, SPF 101, SPF ads for authors, plus $2,500 to spend on author services at Reedsy. Um, and also this year we've added um, an author planner from the, the guys at Purpose Action Success, a, a document, a planner they can use to um, plot out their um, path to success over the next 12 months. And also for Stuart, um, James Rossone is also very generously um, offering to personally mentor him as he uh, cracks on. I think Stuart is a military veteran. Yes, like James. So, I think that's James's, um, uh, James's sponsorship is for a military yeah. veteran. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, that's congratulations to all of those guys. I think Lucy and I were talking last night. I think this is either the fourth or fifth year we've done this now. So we've probably given away over a hundred thousand dollars now i suppose something like that in yeah it's got to be up there somewhere so it's really it's great to see that and and as we've mentioned before we've had several authors doing really really well after getting their start with the foundation people like Britt andrews last year yeah um who is 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 a five-figure author now i think um, and doing really well the year before I think, yeah. yeah so um there will be I suspect in that group we've just announced one or two or maybe more who this time next year might be uh, retiring their husbands or wives and, and, and getting on with a full-time career as a writer. So good luck to everyone. And thanks very much to all the sponsors who've worked with us, especially the guys at Reedsy, but everyone else as well who have been doing this uh, for several years now. Uh, it's one of the things we, we love doing. Also, I, I'd be completely remiss if I didn't say thank you to Lucy, who's, who's been working bloody hard on this over the last couple of weeks to, to pick out um, the winners with the help of the sponsors. We had um, hundreds of applications, as you'd expect, for um, for the foundation. So uh, thanks to her and provided you know, she's not um, burnt out completely, we'll be doing it again next year. Um, so look forward to that. Yeah, I mean, that's the most we've awarded in one go before. Uh, and so the foundation mm. grows year on year. And that's uh, down to Lucy and John, I think, working in the background with her as well on that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's probably just doing a rough calculation. That's probably about thirty five thousand dollars worth of stuff we've uh, we've awarded today for this year. And uh, look forward to growing yeah. that uh, over this year. Great. Uh, well done. Thank you very much indeed. And yeah, look forward. We'll pick out one or two uh, over the next year and talk to them uh, on the podcast and see how they're getting on. Right, Mark, I think we might be ready to move on to our podcast interview. So this was... Nope. No, we're not. No, we're not, because we've got something else to talk about, which is the live show. <laughs> we were, you're lucky I'm here. Um, yes, yeah, so today, as this goes out, we record this a week in advance. Uh, so this will be going on Friday, the... Just checks his watch, the 18th of February. Um, and uh, we think, hopefully, fingers crossed, nothing seems to be suggesting otherwise... We will be offering tickets for the live show um, on the 28th and 29th of June this year. They should now be available. So, um, you you know, we, you probably will know about this already. Uh, we would have told people on the waiting list. It will be mentioned in the Facebook community and the car is probably open now. So um, what would the URL for that be, James, for It'll people be to check? selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live. SPS live. So, yeah, worth worth going to share. We, we think it will sell out. Um so we've got about 900 tickets and there's more than three and a half thousand people on the waiting list. So it will probably sell out. We're, we're trying very hard to make sure it's as equitable as possible um, and so that everyone can, who wants to come gets a, a fair crack of the whip. But uh, if you are interested, I wouldn't hang about. I, I would get, I'd get yourself a ticket as soon as you can because I doubt they'll be available this time next week. Good. Very exciting. Yeah, I had a, a site visit uh, this week and uh, we uh, we walked around the venue. We're, obviously, the big thing for us this time is we're going to have the whole venue. So that does open up some exciting possibilities. And we're going to spend the evening there as well. I mean, people will go out and have a coffee or a drink, probably more likely, um, and then come back and we'll, we'll dance the night away, Mark. Well, you can. I'll, uh, I'll stand at the uh, side tutting disapprovingly. <laughs> 
Right, granddad. Okay, good. Are we ready now for our interview? Yes, we are now. I've got Megan waiting in the wings here. So Megan Quinn, a really delightful uh, interview. I enjoyed it because she's very positive, very successful. And uh, I found it very inspiring. Yes, she writes in romance. I don't write in romance, but that doesn't really matter. It's genre fiction. And this all came from the fact that a few weeks ago, I noticed that numbers one, two, and three in the uh, in the entire Amazon.com store were all SPF people. Um, and that was uh, headed up at the time. I looked at it by Lucy Score. Uh, but they all rotated around each other. So all three of them have been on. We've had Lucy on a couple of times the podcast. Uh, but this time it's the turn of Megan, who also, as I say, got that number one spot. So here's Megan. And then Mark and I will be back for a quick chat. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Megan Quinn, welcome to the self-publishing show. What fun to have you on because we are celebrating with you a, a number one hit just a few weeks ago. And what was so brilliant about this is that you were number one at one point. Lucy's score, I think, was number one like the next day. Amy Dawes was, I think, was at number two and three as well. But anyway, one, two, and three of people who know each other, who are indies, who help each other, part of the SPF community as well. So it was thrilling, I think, to be a to see, see that happening. Um, sort of feels like big things are happening in the indie world at the moment when we're dominating charts like that. So congratulations, I should say, first of all. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was very, very exciting and um, all cheering each other on, sending each other messages. And, um, you know, it didn't necessarily feel like competition. It was more of like, we're doing this together. So, um, and we even said a few times, you know, I'm so glad that I'm doing this with you. <laughs> like, I'm so glad that, that we're all of us together at the same moment doing this. Yeah. That's a very indie thing, isn't it? To sort of help each other, all tides raise ships and so on. Um, all, all uh, rising tide raises all ships. That was it. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, let's, <laughs> Talk a bit about you, Megan. I know you're with APUB now, which is like the Amazon publishing, in-house Amazon publishing wing. Is that right? I think you're with Montlake? Yes, I'm with Montlake. I'm, uh, I release about two books a year with them, and then I release five indie books. Okay, excellent. So you're still doing indie mainly, actually, mm-hmm. on that. Yeah. But let's let's talk a bit about you. You've got a very interesting past, because I've just read uh, some of your notes, which is uh, really, really interesting. I want, to, I want to get into that a bit. So why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and how you ended up writing? So, yeah, I uh, didn't think I was going to be a writer, which I feel like a lot of people say. Um, But I was working for Special Olympics in New York at the time, and um, I had some downtime there. And so I asked my wife if she would get me a Kindle for Christmas. And she said, no, you don't read. Like, why am I going to get you a Kindle? And I was like, I'll read if I have one. And so she gave me one. And um, my commute to work was an hour and 20 minutes one way. And so during that commute, I would just think of these stories that I was constantly reading and how I would like tweak them here and there. Or if like, what if this happened? Or what if that happened? And one day I just decided, you know, maybe I'll write a book. Like, we'll see how it goes. And it was about, it took me a week, which let's be honest, it was pure trash. Right. <laughs> but it was like <laughs> me just filling everything out on the computer. Um, and uh, I kind of just, it was fun for me and I didn't think much of it. I refined, refined, refined. And then um, this was back in 2013 when I self-published for the first time. And I made my own cover I edited myself, which I'm sure everyone's cringing. Like you don't ever want to edit the book yourself because <laughs> you miss everything. And um, it was it was shown because I got many reviews saying this is the worst edited book I've ever read. Right. <laughs> and yeah. And so um, I just kind of did it as a hobby and I didn't really think much of it. Um, you know, I got some traction here and there. I remember after I published the next day, it was like, check your sales. And I was like, oh, and it was three people bought my book and I was like, yay, people you didn't know. Yeah. I was like, this is so exciting. (laughs) People (laughs) bought my book. And so, um, I was just kind of like, you know, winging it or whatever. And then, um, I got a job, um, in Colorado with, um, a national governing body, which a national governing body is basically an Olympic sport. So, um, I don't necessarily given my past, I don't, say what the sport is, but, you know, something like a rowing or gymnastics within USA Olympics. So I got a job within USA Olympics and um, I was working for them 
and writing. And at the time, my wife and I, I was just kind of like, you know, releasing books. And I, it was more of like a side money thing for me, you know, um, not, not thinking too much about it. And then, um, you know, I was like, maybe someday I could be a full-time author, but my wife and I were trying to adopt a baby. And so we were actually using my book money to help with the process. Cause it's really expensive. And You're saying so, to more than three at this stage, you'd obviously yes. moved up in sales a bit. So what, what, I mean, I know we, we won't delve into numbers necessarily, but you were, it, it wasn't quit your job money at this stage for you. Um, no, it was about like low five figures, if anything, you know, okay. I remember the first time, um, we bought a house out here and I was able to contribute like $7,000 okay. for my book money to, um, our down payment. And I have never felt so much pride mm. that I was, you know, my wife was the money maker and I was like, Oh my gosh, like I can help buy this house. And you know, when you're wor working for a national governing body, it's, it's very, um, uh, it's, it's, they don't have a lot of money basically. And right. so like my income was, I want to say like 30,000, like okay. I wasn't making a lot, but I was enjoying what I was doing and I was traveling around the country. And so it was exciting, but, um, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't the one bringing in the money and my wife was. <laughs> and so, um, when we started the adoption process, it was kind of like whatever I made book wise was going towards the adoption so that we could afford it. And, um, when I was working at my job, they basically, when, you're going to have a baby. They want to have this baby plan for you. And they asked me, you know, what is your baby plan for when you do adopt? And I was, and basically they want to know how much time you want off, if you're going to work from home, all these different things. And so I gave them my baby plan. I went on my Christmas break and then I came back from Christmas break and they brought me into HR's office and they were like, we're gonna have to let you go. And I was wow. like, do you know, for someone why? sitting in Europe, you, you've just described so many things that are illegal. I know, I know. <laughs> and it's like a, a four employment state. I can't, I can't remember the exact terms, but I was like, cause my parents were outraged. They were like, what's going on? They told me the reason why I, I was being let go is cause I wasn't doing my job. Mind you, I like at the end of the year, you get a bonus if you went above and beyond and did your job, I got my bonus at the right. end of the year. <laughs> right. So I was like, uh, I'm well, so that confused. Pretty awful. I'm, I know. And I'm not that person who will like get into confrontation. I kind of just, I'm like, okay, thank you. Have a good day. And yeah. like move on. Cause I'm, and I think about it later and I stew about it later. And then I'm like, like, this is what you should have said, Megan, but I'm not that person. And so, um, I was absolutely devastated. And so immediately I came home and I was like, well, I'm going to stick it to them and I'm going to do unemployment. Like I'm going to get that unemployment or whatever. And, um, I told our adoption advisor who was helping us do adoption. And I, I was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. I lost my job today. Like, I hope this doesn't affect the adoption. And she was like, well, did you collect unemployment? I was like, yes, collected the unemployment. And she was like, no, She's like, you need to get on the phone right now and you need to reverse that and strike it from your record. And I was like, oh my gosh, why? And she's like, no, they're not going to, the state won't allow you to adopt if you're on unemployment. And so I was like, okay. Right. And so I um, quickly called, I spent, I think two hours on the phone with the unemployment office and they were able to like strike it from my record and, you know, not move forward with it or whatever. And um, unfortunately at the time, my wife just started a new job. And so she didn't have any time off to be with the baby and I can't start a new job because I wouldn't have time off either. And so my wife and I sat down and I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do at this point. I was making about like 30,000 with book stuff. And I just released the book the day after I got fired. And I was like, should I just go for it? Should I try? Should I you know, try to make something of this. And she was like, you don't have a choice. So yes, like go forward, like make something of it. And so, um, 11 days after I was fired, our, uh, adoption advisor 
told us that a uh, birth mother wanted to pick us as a couple. And we talked on the phone with her and she was like, you guys are perfect. And so I was like, oh my God, Precious I on. need to live. And like the baby was due in May and I was like, or, well, he, he was born in May. We have him. Um, but I was like, I need, to, I need to bust my butt to like make sure that when this baby comes, I can work and support my family at the same time. And so it was kind of like, you have no choice, like make it work. And so that's what I did. Wow. What a situation to be in though. Motivating factors all around, but also pressure that some people wouldn't necessarily thrive under, but clearly you did. Was that connected, do you think, to working in elite sport, which also has that sort of pressure and expectation on it? Um, I think it was more of, cause I, I was a division one athlete. I had a full ride scholarship in college. And so I played at an elite level and I think that you just get used to that kind of pressure, you know? And I mean, I played softball and I can remember in high school being uh, pitching and standing on the mound and looking to the, the backstop and the people behind it. And it is like 10 to 15 college scouts lined up along the backstop with their like hats and their gears and radar guns to see how fast I'm throwing and watching. And that is the kind of pressure that like I grew up with and that I'm accustomed to. And so I would definitely think like any sort of pressure situation that I'm under now as a indie author, I would say comes from that experience. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about, uh, the, the journey since then. So you, you've self-published, I mean, did you write that first book that you wrote and published quite quickly? You, you at some point you transitioned your writing style and in, as, as we all do, the more writing you do, the more experience you get, the better you get preferably. Um, did you take any particular craft courses? Did you read books or did you just simply develop your own way of telling stories? Kind of just uh, my form of research when it, um, is reading other people's stories and I still do it today and I'll read more, um, traditionally published books because their style is much different than, um, let's say like an indie author. There's like a, a different cadence sometimes. And, um, I'll do it now too, where, you know, I write in first person, but I'll read a lot of third person because it gets me out of my head and makes me think differently of how someone would describe something or, you know, say something or someone's different way of telling a story. And so I read all the time. I was just constantly Well, that's reading. funny because you said, you said your wife said to you, I'm not going to buy you a Kindle because you don't read. Yeah. You, you weren't a reader before you started writing. I read a little bit in high school. Like, you know, I did the whole Harry Potter thing and Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. But uh, when college hit, I was just kind of like, let me please Jesus help me get through college. <laughs> like I was not the best student. I actually took a creative writing course and I got a C in it. And, um, and not from the lack of trying, my teacher just didn't like me, didn't like my stories and my flair yeah. for humor. And so she gave me a C. Um, but I just, I didn't have time to read. And so, um, when I graduated, and my wife met me stuff. She met me in college. And so when I graduated from college, she was like, you don't read. And I'm like, well, I could. And so <laughs> I can read, but I know, but like the best, <laughs> I can be. the best thing that happened to me was getting a Kindle. And, um, she forced everyone in my family to give me an Amazon gift card so that I had money to buy books, but I was so frugal. I would make sure I would go to the top 100 free books and I would scan and go through and I'm like, oh, that, and I really loved romance. I've always been a romantic comedy, like movie person. And so um, I would like look for all the free books. And that's actually where I found um, Marie Force. Her, her Made for Love was free, perma free. And I was like, oh, this is so good. And then like 20 books later, I was like, oh, she got me. Yeah, <laughs> like, so just... free, free works, right? Yeah, oh, it's so good. But yeah, yeah I would... I just started binging constantly. And your books, that, that first one you wrote, was that uh, you've done romantic comedy. I should say your, your books are, I, I hope this is not a personal thing to say, but your books are straight, male, yeah, female? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I They're male, that. female. That was, 
that was a conversation. Sorry. That was a conversation my wife and I had when I started writing and I was like, is this okay that it's male, female? And she was like, I prefer that it is. And she was like, I, we both agree that if I wrote a female, female relationship, people know about my life, which the coming out to the readers was a whole, a whole different story, but people know my life now. And I would hate for them to think like, it's very personal, you know, especially if there's sex in a book, like a lot of people don't necessarily know the intimacy between a female and a female. And I would be writing from experience Whereas, you know, writing male, female, it's just kind of like everybody knows how it happens. Yeah. Okay, so I see that. We wanted to keep it really private. And that's not to say that I don't have LGBTQ characters throughout all of my books, because I do. And I even have secondary storylines. But um, the main couple is, is, is always male, female. Yeah. And I think a lot of romance writers will say, particularly mainly female romance, they will sometimes attract the wrong type of attention. So it's, it's a, it's a worthwhile conversation to have, I think, um, mm-hmm. and, and make, make your decisions on that area. But okay, well, that's, that's great. I mean, the, I love your covers, by the way, they stand out, they look brilliant. Um, so yeah. you wrote a uh, romantic comedy. Did you, I mean, there's so many subgenres in, in romance. What, what's in you know, the billionaires, the bullies, whatever I could go on. I've read a few of them now. Um, what did you choose to write and what are you writing now? Um, so I, when I first started, I actually was very into the whole drama of it all. And my books had humor in them, but they weren't, they were more of like, you know, drug and cheating and love triangles and like all this different stuff. And like, if people will go back to my backlist now, like solid readers of mine and they're like, Megan, I'm like, I know, I know. (laughs) <laughs> Things got crazy back then, but um, it wasn't until I wrote the Virgin Romance Novelist, which was my first real romantic comedy, that I actually was like, "Whoa, hold on a second! Like, this is my cup of tea. This is and I like it. I don't know why it took me so long, but I I watched like every Friday night. My parents and I would go to Blockbuster and we'd get a romantic comedy, and I would sit down and watch it. It was like my thing to do." And so I don't know why it took me so long to kind of find that voice. But um, ever since then, I've just been solid romantic comedy. Um, I like to focus a lot on sports romance since I have that background. Um, Especially baseball is one of my number ones. I ventured into hockey this past year, which is I, I the amount of research I have to do on that. <laughs> like the hockey is hockey is a hard sport. Um, <laughs> but yeah. um, I will also do like a lot of. I like, you know, like a New York City office setting. Um, I think it's just very classic rom-com. Um, and then this last one was like teacher romance. So I kind of just, you know, whatever I feel like doing, I go around. I don't really stick to a lot of stuff. I jump around a bit, but it always there's always going to be um, humor in it. So you, you're side by side with Lucy Score and you're pretty similar mm-hmm. genre writers, I would say then. Yeah, I would. Yeah, we we are very much compared to a lot. So, I mean, good company, right? <laughs> yeah, you're both you're both amazing. I'll say that now. Um, okay, so how have you divided your writing in terms of series? It's funny because people always ask Megan, "You have these like all these books that are in a series, but you don't list it on Amazon as a series, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I know." because I have listed like most of my books are in series and I call them standalones, but they're interconnected, interconnected standalone basically. But I don't ever list them in a series because Amazon, whenever I put my books in a series, they always seem to ding me for like the third book. So if I put like, put me in detention is the third book in my teacher series. The first one was see me after class and then earn your extra credit was the second one. So this is the third one. If I put it in a series, there's no way I would have gotten the same kind of, you know, look at it from, from readers, you know, alike, they would just be like, Oh, it's a third book in a series. So I always market it as a standalone. And then in the back, I'll say, if you want to read about this person, if you want to read about this person, here's the information. And then I later on, if this series is kind of old, like I have one called the Burmance series, 
I kind of connected those because I do a lot of stuff with Prime and sales, and I try to keep the continuation in the reading. But when it comes to a new book and then the series isn't finished yet, I'll just market it as a standalone. Right. So all your books, even the ones you have linked as a series, you could pick up one in the middle of the series and it would work as a standalone. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's really interesting. I mean, I'm hopefully publishing my second book this year in a completely different genre, but interconnected, same universe, Mm -hmm. but standalones. So I hadn't really made a decision whether I was going to link them as a series or not. But interesting listening to you talk about that. So maybe the way ahead is to treat each one as this this standalone book and uh, and you feel it gets a little bit more attention. Uh, I do. Way. I do. I, I mean, I don't know the inner workings of Amazon. I wish that I did. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I what I do know is from when I have linked books to when I haven't linked books, the difference between how far it goes in rank and how long it stays within the top 100 is, is vast. And so I have learned that I don't link anything until maybe a year later. And so I just keep it as standalones. And then I use my back matter to propel my backlist, which is, I mean, the backlist pays for everything basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the profit comes from. Mm-hmm. So in terms, yeah. in terms of, um, uh, you're right. We'll talk about writing process and marketing. Uh, but I want to carry on with writing for the moment. So where you are now, what is your kind of, uh, plan for 2022, for instance, how many books are you going to write and what sort of, um, which series in inverted commas are they going to go into? <laughs> so uh, right now I'm releasing seven books. Um, two of them are with Montlake, like I said earlier. Um, the first one comes out in February and the second one comes out in October. And then I'll, I'll, I'll fill in. Like I usually base my releases off when Montlake releases. And um, within there, I'll have five, five releases and... Um, one I already did, which has put me in attention. And so that closes off the teacher series that will be done complete and done. Um, April will be, um, the second book in my hockey series. Um, and then I don't like to plan too far ahead because I'm kind of a nutcase and in the middle of the night, I'll come up with an idea and I'm like, I have to write it right away. Like I, like, I don't like to future plan things out because I change my mind constantly. And so, but I do know when I have to release and I have my like editing schedule set up and, and audio booked and all that different stuff. Okay. Um, in terms of your writing then, how do mm-hmm. you, I mean, obviously you write quite fast, seven books in a year is, is going some. So what's your mm-hmm. writing process look like? So I usually, right now I have a book full of ideas and, um, depending on how a certain book does. So, um, for instance, uh, a not so meet cute released, um, November 2nd and that book hit number one. It was in the top five. I want to say for like a month, it was insane. The craziest release I think I've ever had. It's number 15 now. Um, it's just kind of stayed there. And whenever I write a book, especially a new one, I always insert some sort of side character that could possibly get a book in the future. And if the book does well, then I will take that side character and I will develop it into another book. So, you know, I, you know, Kiss and Don't Till was my first hockey book and that came out in September that hit number two, it's done exceedingly well. So I wrote the second hockey book, which comes out in April now. And so I looked at a not so cute. I have two characters in there that I wrote in there that people are like, Oh, can we have this story? Can we have a story? And so I'm like, okay, that's doing well. I look at my story ideas and I go, how could these two characters fit within my story ideas? And then I pick one (laughs) and then I start writing. So I really base it off of, you know, how a book's doing what I want to write and when I should write it and how quickly, you know, and usually it takes me about, I would say three to four weeks to write a hundred to 150,000 words. It depends on how crazy I am, but, um, yeah, I will just kind of blast it out real quick and then edits are, or it's where all the magic happens. <laughs> yeah. So you're writing eight to 10,000 words a day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I love the way you do that, by the way, the, you know, allowing the books to tell you, allowing the readers effectively to tell you where you're going to go next. 
Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it's just kind of smart business. You got to see one, you have to see what the market's doing. You have to see, you know, what's trending. I'm always looking at the top 100. You know, I'm always seeing who is in the top 100, what they're writing, what readers are saying. I'm in a bunch of other author groups and I'm always kind of observing and seeing what readers are saying about, you know, different things that they've read from other authors and really just learning. And I like one of my biggest things is I sit back and I just watch and I like to see, you know, what everyone is doing, how they're doing it, what's successful, what's not successful. And then I will look at my own stuff and I'll see what did readers like, what do readers not like? You know, sometimes I write a strong female character, you know, and I hate to say it, but it's not as widely as accepted as, you know, someone who is maybe a little bit more sassy and fun and like witty or whatever. And I've learned that a lot of the time. You can see the trend of, you know, strong female character book didn't do as well. Strong female character book didn't do as well. And so I really watch for that. And then when I write my next book, I'm like, okay, what have we learned from reviews? Cause I read them, even the horrible ones. <laughs> and then what's trending, what's, you know, what are your readers wanting? And then I kind of form it all together with a bunch of tropes that I like. So properly writing to market. I mean, really paying attention to the nuances of the market. Yeah. Um, and then my, mo my mom, like, sorry, my mom, like stuff is a little bit more high concept rom-com. And so that one, you know, I'll really sit down. It's not necessarily geared toward any kind of like market research that I've done or, you know, what's, what's happening in the book world. It's more of how can I turn this book into a movie? And so I really think of it that way and, um, kind of formulate it so that there's a lot of different story arcs within it and um they've been doing really well so and, and how does that work with with mont lake uh do they do you have to pitch ideas to them and they choose one or do they just accept what you're going to write or so when i first started with them my first contract i obviously had to pitch a story to them and i had to do like i think it was three thousand words at the time I had to write three thousand words um and then with my next contract they were like toss us some ideas and you know we'll see we'll see what we like. And that's kind of how it's been recently. It's just, I throw down some ideas. My book that comes out in October was supposed to be a completely different book. And in like 1130 at night, I was talking to my wife and I was like, I can't write this, this book. I just, this is not for me. This is not what I want. And she was like, uh, okay. And I was like, I have to start it tomorrow. I literally have no time for this to like, you know, mess around with different ideas. And so I sat, um, I laid in my room with like a little light on 1130, writing down different ideas and looking at different tropes and how can I make this more high concept rom-com? And um, luckily I came up with an idea and I sent it to my agent and I was like, please, can I switch it to this? And Montlake was like, this is amazing. Go for it. And so they're, they're really accommodating and um, they've been amazing to work with. So, you know, they kind of just go with whatever, idea i have which is which is yeah. just amazing in general and what just on the subject of monlake i am going to return to process in a moment but on the subject of monlake what why did you why did you sign a deal with them when you're obviously doing very well as an indie author so i signed with them i think it was back in 2018 and i was very adamant about wanting to develop a team that i could work with that would help me expand my readership and being an author who's all in Kindle Unlimited, I knew that Montlake would be my best option to kind of help expand that readership. And I remember when my first book came out with them, it was that second chance. And I was kind of had these like big hopes and dreams of what, what would come from working with, you know, a publisher and, and the book did well, but it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. You know, it was kind of like, I almost felt a little let down. I remember having a conversation with my agent afterwards and like freaking out, um, embarrassed about it now, but she was like, Megan, it's the long run. It's the marathon with them. Like you have to like put in the time and, you know, it will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And so I was like, okay, you know, well, I'll, I'll see this through. And with every single release, I've seen it grow and grow and grow. And the last one that I had with them was the Highland Fling. And that one came out in August and it has done exceedingly well. It, 
I was blown away with how well it's done. It was on two billboards in New York City. And, wow. you know, it just you got pictures. kind of, yeah, it just expanded things to a point that I was like, okay, like I see this partnership and I really consider a partnership with them. I don't see it as me, you know, asking them to do stuff like whatever I release with them. I do the same exact release marketing plan that I do with my indie stuff. Because I know that if I'm putting in the time, they're putting in the time and we're working together to make this release amazing. And so I think sometimes, you know, not everybody, but sometimes authors just kind of rely on a publisher, which is fine. But I'm, if I'm going to be a part of this, if I'm releasing this book, I don't want to rely on somebody. I want to do just as much as they're doing. And so, you know, the teamwork and the partnership with them has been absolutely amazing. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. You say the billboards in New York and even within the Amazon ecosystem, presumably being an internal Amazon publisher, they can reach parts that we can't reach. So they are going to find readers for you, which inevitably you will benefit from. They'll benefit from and you'll benefit from for your other books as well. Yeah, exactly. And they they actually did um, my book, The Wedding King, Wedding Game came out in February last year and they put it as an Amazon first read. And that was one of the first steps to actually expanding that readership. And oh my God, they were like, prepare for some horrible reviews. They're right. like, we don't, they, we don't know if there's like a group of people who are like, okay, the AFR list is out. Let's see who we control. Like I was like, oh my gosh. And there's, you know, there's a, um, gay couple a gay couple and a lesbian couple in the book and got got hit for that got hit for you know using foul language like it was just i was like okay well i'm glad they prepared me like i'm just gonna go sit and cry in a corner for a second and then i'll be ready to go <laughs> but it did expand the readership and it's you know i've seen a huge difference between last year and the year before yeah i guess the higher above the pulpit you are the more uh thicker skin you're going to need at some point but that's that goes with success which is yeah that's tough though it's horrible um mm -hmm. uh but you, you know you can you can wipe your tears with your dollar bills can't you from uh, selling the books so. <laughs> and then post a picture to them of that um so back to process so you say the magic happens in the editing so once you finish your first draft what what does that look and feel like in terms of where it's going to end up so usually the first the first draft i'll finish and I'll be like, oh, thank Jesus that's over with. <laughs> like, I'm so glad the book's finished. But I always have this like inkling in the back of, you know, my head that I'm like, this book sucks. You know, I know that I have repeated myself a million times. How many times can they catch their breath? You know, how many times is he going to smirk? My God, Megan, come up with something else. <laughs> and so it's, and I know like that first draft after I finished, I'm like, thank God it's done, but I know this is crap. And so like, I will go through and I will usually add about 10 to 20,000 words, just really drawing out, you know, the, the comedic humor and making sure if there's some sort of flopstick situation within the book that I'm really driving it home and I'm, and I'm making the reader feel that embarrassment, which makes it funny. And I really kind of explore, you know, different options. I fill in, I fill in the holes that, you know, I'm like, this is how the book ended, but I'm totally missing like the connection points in the beginning of how it ended. And so, you know, I'll really navigate through and um, my wife absolutely hates that I live in my brain constantly because she'll be telling me something. We have two kids now. Um, <laughs> and be she'll be, yeah, I will. She'll be like, are you listening? And I'm like, what, huh? Sorry. <laughs> and so, but that's how it is. You know, if I'm, if I'm in the middle of a book, especially edits, I will be constantly thinking of how I can make that book better. And so the edits are just me kind of refining those, making sure that I'm not using the same description. And I have a few books that I use for that. Um, I wish I could remember what they are, but one's like, Oh yeah, I don't know. I know. I'll have to. I'll send you I know an email you mean, later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. They're description books. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, description yeah. books that really help. And so, like, I'm like, hmm. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how you describe a kiss. Better. I'm going to have to start using them. Have, there's a lot yeah. of shrugging. <laughs> shrugging goes on in my books. I've just realized a lot of shrugging. <laughs> yeah. You can only shrug so many times, can't you? So you know what? We... Like I, 
I have a lot of looking with the eyes everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all have that. Um, and uh, yeah, I was going to ask you a little bit. So you go, you, it goes into edit, uh, and so, and so you you make those changes. But is that? I mean, how long does that process take? You having written it quite quickly, is the editing process the same length again? Yeah, it's usually about a week, which I know. Okay. And and I don't usually use beta readers or anything like that. Um, I have tried that once and it it resulted in an absolute disaster. And so the only person that I really listen to when it comes to the book is my editor who does kind of a beta read to begin with. And then it'll go to grammar and then I'll go back to her and she'll like refine and she'll take out all my, what like I miss, you know, I like to say little a, a lot apparently. So she'll take out a lot of that stuff and then kind of just really tighten it up. So, um, but yeah, it'll take me about a week, um, depending on how much I'm feeling the book or not. And then, um, I'll send it off to edits. And you have the same editor for a while, cause that can be very useful when you're writing in the same universe, because they hopefully will pick up things that maybe two books ago, you want some consistency, right? Because I, yeah, I know lots of authors, I've... I haven't got to that stage yet, but not lots of authors do say they, they struggle sometimes to keep a track of everything. Yeah, I have. I've used um, Marion Archer uh, for about five years now. And um, I just started using someone for grammar. Um, oh, maybe two years ago. And then a uh, solid proofreader in the last year. So I really have a, a team that comes together and it's seen and my wife is the final person who reads it. Right. <laughs> she did still do the final read. Was your wife a romance reader before? No. And it's no, so okay. not her genre. She she just read Verity by uh, Colleen Hoover. And she was like, this is my cup of tea. Like, this is what I like to read. And I was like, that's not what I write. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm genre. Um, yeah, but she, she actually, she works um, with me full time now as well. And so she'll do like all of the, like, make sure we don't go to tax jail and all the different stuff. And then she's the final eyes on the book just to make sure that there's nothing that was missed. And, you know, there always seems to be something at one point, you know, it's, it, it gets read by five different pairs of eyes. And I want to say six or seven times. And it's still, you know, we, Gosh. we try our best, but there always seems to be something, but yeah, of yeah Marion, Marion at this point, she, she's like, Megan, when are you ever going to learn? And it's something like, I'm so bad with like lay and lie, like yeah. lay on the bed, lie in the bed. Like I'm so terrible. She's like, when are you ever going to learn? That's a oh, hard one. That's, that's why I hired you. <laughs> yes, exactly. You do that for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can't understand everything. You're, you're, you're busy bringing people together and splitting them up in your books. There's a lot of work goes involved in that. And I was going to ask you about that. Are you a, a friends to lovers, enemies to lovers? I mean, there's different, different ways of tropes within kind of romantic comedy. What's your, or your particular one or do you mess about with different different ideas? I, I, I go about with all all of, you know, I love a, a neighbors to lovers, a friends to lovers, and enemies to lovers. I think particularly my favorite is enemies to lovers, just because you can drive up the tension very quickly. That's I'm writing, I just started a book this week, and um it's enemies to lovers, and it immediately is like sparks are flying because of the fact that they hate each other so much. And so you can build that tension so easily. So when they do finally kiss, readers are like, oh, praise Jesus, like it finally happened. <laughs> and so um, I I particularly like an enemy to lovers, but I just go about, you know, friends, neighbors, coworkers, whatever. I like them and all. In, in sports, you always get a bit of testosterone about Danny. So there's always a good, I can see why sport lends itself to a lot of romantic books and um uh, a bit of that rivalry and all that stuff. So there's a, a long tradition yeah. of that, isn't there? They have Although, all that adrenaline they have to get rid yeah. of, right? <laughs> exactly. Although it does mean you're now having to learn the rules of ice hockey, which is quite interesting. I know. I was like, <laughs> how long is this penalty? He just punched somebody. <laughs> yeah. Google's my best friend. <laughs> yes. Thank goodness for Google. Um, and uh, so you you play with all those different tropes within the books. Uh, and in terms of the level of, of steam in the books, do you stay consistent with that? Is it under the covers? Over, I mean, I'm, I've done so many interviews with romance authors. I'm quite an aficionado of the sort of levels of, uh, of spice now. Um, but what, we what's... go, it is full force 
all the way okay. graphic. <laughs> it's the train into the tunnel cutaway shot. Yeah, uh, of East is, yeah it's funny because my Montlake books are like my Montlake books have full on sex scenes, but they're a little bit more on the romantic side. And just because I feel like <laughs> I know my editor and my agent so well at this point that I feel sweaty and nervous to like write like a super sexy scene, knowing that they're reading it. I know that sounds stupid, but you still feel self-conscious <laughs> after all these I books. Feel self- yes. Yeah. I feel self-conscious. And so, but with my indie stuff, it is like, everything's up for play. Like I, like my, a not to meet cute. So much stuff happened in that book. And people were like, that was the most innocent cover I've ever seen with the most spicy, like inside ever. And I was like, I know, I don't know what happened, but things got a little crazy. And so my indie stuff tends to be a little bit more on the spicy side and my mom likes stuff more romantic and Steph, actually my wife, she loves my mom like books for that specific reason. Cause she was <laughs> so nice to read my indie stuff. And she's like, this Megan, like, what are you, how do you know this? <laughs> Do you think? And I'm like, it's okay. People love it. <laughs> Again. Um, and a not so meet cute, the book that mm-hmm. exploded for you. And you say, I've just looked it up. You're right. It's 14 in the charts today. What? Yeah. Do you know what it was? Have you tried to analyze why that captures people's attention? Yeah. So I really think it has a lot to do with one, the cover is amazing. Yeah. And uh, it really has a super rom-com feel. But, you know, on the inside, it is very, very spicy. And so I think it's almost confusing at first because, you know, you think you're going to get this like, oh, this fun rom-com when, you know, inside you're like, oh, my gosh, like what's going on in here? But it it also has a um, sort of like a retelling of Pretty Woman, but like a modern day tale of it. And um, without the, you know hooker part or whatever <laughs> yeah but um it it just has this classic you know um enemies to lovers type story which i absolutely love it also has you know a fake fiance trope in it it has you know a deal they make they strike up a deal to like help each other out which i know is a very popular trope as well and so i think it just hits like everybody's you know boxes everyone's like they love it because it you know, kind of encompasses all these different things about romance that they enjoy. Well, that's great. I'm so, so pleased for you. Um, it's been great chatting to you. And uh, as always, always learn a lot when I talk to romance mm-hmm. authors, but uh, don't work too hard. It sounds like you have a very full on existence. Are you going <laughs> to slow down at some point? Was that, the, is that the driven athlete in you against the back in this back in the glare of the lights and the softball? It is. It is. Honestly, I have a lot of people telling me like, are, are you, I'm a, um, I don't know if you pay attention to the Enneagram scale at all, but the personality type, I'm a three, which is known as the achiever. And um, basically their self-worth is based upon what they're producing and how well they're doing. And if people are praising them for it. And um, it just like, it is me to a T and it is hard for me to slow down. It is hard for me to kind of stop and stop my mind. It's not necessarily me just always like, go, go, go. It's my mind saying, here's a story and here's a story and here's a story. And so it's hard for me to just kind of sit back and not write it. And I know at some point I probably will slow down a little bit, but right now I just have too much to say. And so I'm going to keep going. And it has been life-changing for you. And I think you you slipped in there that you've basically retired your wife as well from her job whatever Mm -hmm. she was doing and that's uh, that's a great trope we love to hear in the indie circles where people retire their partners and they will become part of the uh, the family business and that's um that's a brilliant thing Mm -hmm. well megan well done thank you so much indeed for coming on it's been really fun chatting to you i hope we get to meet at some point and um uh, maybe one of the conferences and uh and i can buy a drink to the uh all these amazing authors who sit next to each other at the top of the uh, other charts which is always fun to see yeah it would be amazing (laughs) This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. Um, Megan Quinn, really enjoyed uh, talking to her and uh, just great to see the success. The indies are pretty dominant in the... um... In fact, I'll tell you who else is dominant. We mentioned them from time to time, but I've been looking at doing some Fuse book stuff and been looking at some suspense 
uh, titles recently and I was looking at the suspense charts and I think with six books in the top 30 or so were Caroline Peckham and Suzanne Valenti. I mean, their books are everywhere in every chart you look at. They do suspense. Mm, yeah. Well, okay, you know, it. it's, uh, you know, a suspenseful, <laughs> suspenseful elements. But, you know, rubbing shoulders with J.K. Rowling and these big sellers uh, and Richard Osman yeah. here in the UK and, um, yeah, whoever's big selling in the States. So really brilliant to see. It really feels like a indie, well, we've said it's come of age some time ago, but it's uh, it's you can't ignore it now. And the publishing companies won't be ignoring it. They'll be seeing the sales figures and those charts, and uh, uh, which is great. Good. I think that might be it, Mark. It's been a bit of a, a bit of a mammoth uh, podcast episode. It has, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if you're going to get a ticket for the show next Friday, um, and well, actually, this, this Friday this goes out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm slightly confused at the moment, but yeah, get that. Um, check it out right now, um, and uh, hopefully see you in June. But for that, um, yeah, we should probably call it a day, I guess. Yeah. In London, baby. Yep. Thanks very much to the team behind the podcast. And uh, especially this week, we'll say another thank you to Lucy uh, Dawson, who has looked after the foundation winners. Congratulations to all them again. Uh, I sh suppose we should add that if you're interested in applying for the foundation, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com, uh, you will see there's a foundation tab at the top. Obviously, we don't make the awards till later in the year. We start that process, but you can uh, look at the criteria now. That's it. Okay. All that remains for me to say is it's goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.